So I'm just gonna go straight away to our introduction so that we don't um, really uh, push too much of the time. So hello everyone, uh, welcome to this creative hacktivism uh, webinar. My name is Jeksana Soro. For most of you who don't already know me, um, so for the people who don't know me, I'm just gonna give a quick intro to who I am. So I am the co-founder and team leader uh, of Platform Africa, one of the AskNet hubs. Uh, but beyond that role, I am a lot of other things, a graphic designer for one, a musician, producer, podcaster. I'm actually sometimes ashamed of all the mighty multi-hyphenated things that I do. Um, so I just go with artist. Um, and because I've realized that, you know, all these seemingly different modes of expressions in the work that I do, whether it's the writing, or the music, or even designing a piece of graphics. It's really yeah. about one thing. Uh, and that is about experimenting with new ideas and, and learning. So you basically theorize, you do things and learn from doing those things. Um, and I also think that really one uh, central concept that intersects most of these things that I also do, I think is the idea of hacking. And I, and I don't mean breaking a bank or bootlegging the new Barbie movie. <laughs> um, I mean, doing things differently or doing difficult things differently in a way that challenges the constraints or the borders of our society, whether those are social or political. And I just want to guys, I want to tell you guys a quick story about like my first experience with the word hacking, which um, was introduced to me for the first time as a necessarily not a bad word, right? Because, you know, we watch movies and we know what hacking is in movies. Um, and so that experience was in 2015 when the peace hack camp was happening. I was part of the group of young people who were being trained as part of the activities that led to this event. And I grew really curious about why such a huge event with potential to attract uh, people internationally, whether from government or academia or DIY experts locally together, why it should carry a name with such a red flag word, hacking. <laughs> Um, until I had a conversation, Steve might not remember this, but we hack, We asked him, like, what is hacking? Why should we call this event the Peace Hack Camp? And he basically demonstrated us the, to us the idea of hacking in a very fun way. So he took out a chopstick that he had in his, uh, in his backpack. He carries that everywhere. Um, so it turns out there's a disparity in power plugs and charges all across the world. Ah, there's the bag. There's the famous bag and the chopstick. <laughs> uh, so there's a disparity in, in charges and power plugs all across the world. In Europe, they have a power plug or socket that takes two pins. In the UK, there's three. And in South Sudan, we basically import whatever we have our hands on. Uh, so basically, he carries this uh, chopstick to be able to hack into power plugs, whatever it is, uh, to be able to, to charge his devices. Um, so for me, that really stood out to me because I don't think that it's about just hacking a power plug to charge a device. It's about a way of doing things, uh, doing things differently, or like I said before, really challenging what the constraints of a certain environment is. And I think that that approach or that moment has been profound in my life and also in the life of our, of our organization, because since then we have, you know, tried to critique or intervene or test the limits of what the constraints in our environment are, whether it's about bringing a community together to, through repair cafes to fix broken devices, or it's about really promoting the ideal, ideas of upcycling, or about like recently uh, when me and my colleague took on a challenge to do a song about our community and then finding out that our community that we come from doesn't have a genre of music. And it's like, how do we take on this project to tell a story about our people in a very authentic way without actually understanding what our type and genre of music is? So we took a little dive researching into what our music is took really all the crappy recordings of people dancing in the village recorded over mobile phones. And we took it to the studio and asked the producer to try to recreate those drumming patterns or, or style of music. 
And in the end of the day, we ended up with a beautiful song that came out. But besides the song that came out, we had another surprising outcome that came from the song. The song that is completely stacked with our local type of drumming patterns or a musical instrument at the core on the surface ended up sounding like I'm a piano, which is a South, South African genre of music. So for us, it led us, led us to a question and a discussion. What is our type of music? And does I'm a piano belong to more than one country? And so we think it's a bit of beautiful conversation to start figuring out like what is our genre of music? What is uh, our identity of music and all of that? And I think it was because of all the experimentation that we did, all the hacking that we did using all available resources and all the ones to figure out what this sound is. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about the ideas of creative hacking. I uh, Myself, I'm really new to the field of creative hacking. I do hacking in different ways. Me and Steve know that well. Carry a chopstick or take old craft recordings and making music out of it to figure out what our cultural sound or music is. Um, but today we're gonna listen to really amazing experts from the Disruption Lab. We have Sabrina and Agnesi uh, from Disruption Lab who are going to take us through these sessions. So I think today in this webinar, we're going to be discussing what creative activism is, maybe why it is important, and examples of creative activist projects maybe. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. And today, of course, like I mentioned, we are joined by Sabrina and Arnisi. And I'm also really happy to hear that we have a presenter, a guest, Brian Banyama, who would be uh, joining us. Now, Ugandans are cool people. I live in Uganda. And Brian's an artist as well. So I'm really excited to hear his insights and, uh, and, and, uh, and you know, his experiences that he's bringing to, to this webinar. So without further ado or wasting your time, I would like to pass the mic to Sabrina to start our session. So Sabrina, you're welcome. Oh, thank you, Jixana. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm very, very happy and excited. And um, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for this invitation to Disruption Network. Thank you uh, for, I mean, we have been lucky, me and Daniese, to uh, take this role among the other people in uh, Disruption Network and build uh, this uh, session. Um, so, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm gonna uh, share my screen immediately. So, 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 um, I can also um, uh, keep going with the introduction of uh, this day. So, um, I'm Sabina, uh, uh, Italian uh, uh, from Italy and uh, based in uh, Berlin. Um, the same city of Rogue Agency and uh, of Disruption Network Lab, of course. So thank you, uh, Rogue, for inviting us, for inviting uh, Disruption Network. Um, so uh, Disruption Network is an NGO. Um, I already a little bit introduced uh, our um, activities in the uh, Telegram chat. So actually today I'm not going to talk uh, in, the, in depth about uh, disruption network. Um, but of course, I'm happy to provide, uh, so we have a lot of resources online, so I will provide more resources, useful resources also after the conversation of today about the disruption network. In general, is an NGO that examines the intersection of politics, technology, and society, exposing misconduct, uh, and wrongdoing of the powerful. And we do that with a special focus on how technology is involved in this misconduct and wrongdoing of the powerful. Um, just a quick recap of today and of the next, next session. So the, today is the first of the two sessions. We're gonna have more about creative activism. Today is gonna be more of an overview uh, of uh, what uh, can we identify as creative activism. Uh, the next week on Tuesday afternoon, it will be uh, with Agnes um, that I'm going to introduce very quickly, very soon. It's, uh, it's gonna be a bit more practical. Um, uh, the second session of creative activism. So 
Today, we're going to start very much on time. Uh, we will have for 45 minutes um, a kind of a frontal slash interactive sessions in which we will see several case studies and have the possibility of a bit discussing uh, about various topics. I propose to have a quick break if we have still time at 11. And then after the break, I'll be happy and honored to introduce Ryan to this, um, to this um, pool, to this audience and uh, uh, introduce him, let him explain a, a bit about his work. And then uh, that would be very nice to have uh, a bit of a um, collective conversation uh, with Brian and uh, all of you, of course. So um, I recap what I think uh, are um, some of the objectives of today. So um, learning about forms and goals of digital activism or creative activism and hacking. We will see a bit this ecosystem of words actually what is uh, kind of uh, conveying. Um, the idea is to inspire, uh, to take action in your online and offline community based on projects which result quite relevant in their intentions. Um, second goal, raising awareness uh, more in details on the hidden side of the technology we daily use and uh, identify tools for growing our literacy while we navigate media and the internet in general. So um, um, yeah, so in the presentation, there's also a little collection of creative forms of peaceful protest that can uh, invigorate your communities and generate collaboration and change. Um, yeah, then last but absolutely not least, uh, we will um, quickly navigate a couple of online resources that are uh, very, very well done for, uh, yeah, again, for this um, uh, media literacy and uh, to acquire um, skills for uh, investigate, for investigation. Um, facilitators, so Agnese Trocchi, uh, social media manager at Disruption Network Lab. Agnese, please, if you open the mic, I want to say hello. <laughs> hello, I'm Agnese. Nice to meet you all. Um, again, Agnese will be facilitator next week. Uh, but yeah, of course, uh, she's also uh, here today. And then myself, uh, I work as a community manager at Disruption Network Lab. And I have a background in architecture and hacking. Um, so uh, quickly, uh, I see that there's uh, no need of uh, declaring how we have to work today because also, uh, so um, show your name, feel safe, participate and ask questions. It's really, and uh, you can interrupt me anytime. Of course, you know, uh, uh, raising your hand or writing in the chat or just open the mic if you really uh, have to say something and I don't notice that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, use all the tools of Zoom and uh, feel free to um, intervene in the conversation. Um, okay, so let's uh, say, let's warm up uh, a bit and see, uh, let's start with the concept of activism. Um, I mean, I created a Mentimeter link which is also beautiful um and um if you uh, like um you can um uh, use the uh if i find the chat somewhere okay, okay. um the idea is to start aligning uh on the uh concept the idea of activism for us and um basically um yeah, so I'm very curious, actually, uh, when you think of an activist, who or what comes to mind in your community or so on a you know, global level? What is the, um, um, yeah, what, what do you associate to uh, when you think about an activist? Uh, in the meanwhile, will you um, contribute? Please go to the link I just put in the chat. I will um, open the Mentimeters that is 
here. And you can see my screen. Um, so um, one response, very cool. Action, very good, I agree. Um, Movement, work, definitely, definitely. The work of an activist is a lot. I mean, the, an activist has lots of work to do and is pretty unclear, actually, um, since it's not an institutionalized profession, how is going to be, where is going to be the sustainability of an activist, for example? Um, well, I passion, integrity. Yeah. So, um, for example, for me, when I think about an activist, yeah, the value or the respect I feel that uh, an activist um, is actually making as a um, flag element of uh, their life, risk taking, definitely. Policy change. Interesting, yeah. So I guess we, uh, as a warm up, is um, fantastic because I see uh, that um, the concept of activist is absolutely um, known and um, well, let's say, uh, respected and taken into account of people for people. Very nice, yeah. Uh, change within the community, campaigning, action, passion, some who campaign, campaigning, definitely, policy changer. Yeah. Um, okay, that's, uh, thank you for um, your answers. Um, let's go back here. Um, so starting from that point, um, we can uh, try to explode the word um, creative activist. Uh, so in, in thinking, okay, if um, the creative activist is actually an activist that sustains all um, the um, values and uh, way and agencies that we just uh, collected in the word bubble, but um, includes two other identities, which is the one of the creator or of the artist and the one of the actor. So just to see this um, diagram with, um, yeah, saying the intersections about among the various, uh, between the, uh, among the various um, souls or identities of the creative activist, we can see that um, the creative activist mix tech and art for criticizing how we use technology or how technology uses us. Um, it explores um, ethical dilemmas within the digital realm. Um, and uh, yeah, as, um, as a netto says, is mixing uh, the, the one of the artists and the one of the activists, challenge norms, provoke change in society, and raise awareness. That could be a, um, sort of a, a correct definition. In general, we could say that creative activism um comes from the internet activism, meaning the involvement of electronic communication technologies such as different types of uh, online uh, means and digital means to uh, enable faster and uh, more effective communication by citizen movements or uh, creating ideas about uh, potential um, movements and um, stances and causes that uh, people should see and take. Um, I think that um, besides this warm up, let's dig into some of um, important and clarifying uh, pre uh, uh, creative activist project. Just one sec. Okay. Um, so um, let's dig into the critical engineering manifesto, which I think is a very, very good starting point. 
um, before you so the critical engineer manifesto is what you see in the screen. It's just uh, ten points written by three people uh, with names and uh, surnames, um, and a document written uh, in two thousand and eleven. Um, so int before introducing this manifesto, um, I would like to yeah to discuss this quote from the ph uh, philosopher Bruno Latour. Um, uh, which is highly influencing the thing, the thoughts and the philosophy behind the critical engineering manifesto. Uh, so Latour says, uh, when a machine runs efficiently, when the technology responds to the need we have when we use it, one needs focus uh, only on its input and output and, on, and not on its internal complexity. In this case, this is Zoom we are using for talking. It's a perfect example. We don't really, uh, we are not really questioning right now what is actually making us communicating and seeing each other and hearing each other um, exactly on a technological level and why we are communicating in this way and not really in another one because of the engineering of this machine. Why the engineering of this machine gets as a result this actual interface we have between us, um, because we just need to, our needs of talking to each other is fulfilled and uh, we're happy with that. Um, so the interesting and urgent um, aspect to consider and think about is that the more the science uh, and the technology uh, evolve and succeed and become more complex, the more it's impossible for us to know what's inside Zoom or what's inside any of the digital technologies that we daily use. And this is a threat. This is a fall because, um, yeah, so the distance between uh, how we interact in the world and the knowledge that we have of the means that let us interacting and acting in the world, it's uh, wider and wider and wider. So let's uh, go in the... Uh, to read a couple of points of the Critical Engineering Manifesto, which I think it's a text that actually requires um, deep attention, meaning requires a moment. I mean, it requires to be read and reread very often and um, in detail. So I'd like to read, I think, the first and uh, the fifth point. So the Critical Engineer. Um, considers engineering to be the most transformative language of our time. They say language, uh, but we could say also phenomena um, that actually shaping the way we move, communicate, and think. So technology is nowadays a phenomenon so pervasive that it's shaping uh, the way we move, communicate, and think more than anything else. So the critical engineer uh, in opposition to the engineer, <laughs> um, has the mandate, the mission, um, to actually study this language, this phenomena, study technology, uh, exploit it, and actually show what is actually the influence that this technology has on us. Because uh, the knowledge and the skills for really exploding technologies and really understand the super hyper complexity of it, uh, yeah, it's in the hands of few people. And this, and we know that. We will see a further project, a couple of projects showing, very good in showing how com the complexity behind certain consumer technologies um, that most of the people use. Uh, and uh, get worried about that <laughs> because some people try to explode that complexity and, and expose it. Um, but on the, with this function, with this mission of exposing the influence as a social mandate, I'm an engineer, a critical engineer, and I wanna use my skills and knowledge and time and research effort to show people what's behind technology and how much is influencing everything we do without us being aware of that. Um, so the point number five of this manifesto um, is exactly this, the critical engineer recognizes that each work of engineering engineers its user. 
Um, so there's no technology without uh, behavioral modeling in most of the cases uh, or an influence on our behavior. And very often how this technology is made is, and the fact that we have to adopt a certain behavior for using it, it's not casual. It's actually completely and fully uh, planned and strategized and designed and decided. Especially um, what the critical engineer manifesto states is that proportional to the user's dependency on that technology, uh, the user's behaviors is engineered by the engineers of that technology. So the more a technology is uh, relevant and important, the more or create dependency, the more um, the behavior, uh, the dependency behavior has been actually designed on purpose. Let's go back to the presentation and let's see, let's make first a question. I know that but uh, again, I said the critical engineer manifesto requires a deeper uh, analysis, a deeper time to read it all and think about it and make make it, uh, the, the, the manifesto our manifesto. But I'd like to um, try to yeah then discuss about why do we need a critical approach to technology because it's not obvious at all. And I'm gonna share again if I find the chat here, uh, MNT meter, uh, if you like to join it again and uh, yeah, uh, contribute to uh, the reason to defining why uh, we need a critical approach to technology more and more, or what are the consequences? Ah, good point. Um, yeah, the critical, all the uh, websites of critical engineering are down. This, uh, so this is something I want to investigate because until a year ago, they weren't, uh, but now they are all down. And I actually had no real time for uh, getting information about why. So that's the reason why the resources about them are accessible only from uh, other uh, so other links and not uh, their, their servers. Um, are down, are, I don't know exactly. Um, we will investigate. Um, tiki tiki. So the link results. One response, game freedom. Okay, interesting. So we need an approach, um, a critical approach because by Critical approach, we acquire knowledge and knowledge make free. <laughs> because of deep fake, totally because of surveillance. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, fair enough. It's actually a tricky question uh, because uh, exactly because we don't know we need a critical approach. Uh, because we don't know what's behind it. We don't know who designed the thing. We don't know what is the purpose behind most of the most complex technologies that we use, because we don't know. That's a great question. That's a great answer. Um, so I guess we can jump. Um, thank you for answering. Um, we can then go um, a bit further. So among this, um, uh, um, critical engineers. Uh, let's see, I mean, critical engineers can be definitely uh, a synonym of ethical hacking, at least for me. And uh, for describing, uh, for one, uh, from uh, taking the definition of one of the uh, critical engineers, what hacker meant, just to go inside the term hacking, um, yeah, I, I, I like to take his definition. Um, so the term hacker has acquired a very negative sub meaning in the last decades. Uh, but in practice, in practice, especially in this realm of um, ethical hacking and critical engineering, um, the hacker depicts um, a researcher, a researcher that has a deep interaction with um, their computer and um, a deeper interaction that 
and the deeper knowledge uh, that actually uh, the hacker uses in order to extract as much as possible from it. This is not a negative thing. It's not forcibly um, an extraction of information from a machine that actually is, uh, is forcibly used for harming anybody. Um, so the work of um, this person, Dania Vazilev, it's really, really interesting. He actually works especially with um, yeah, internet networking, uh, like how actually internet uh, exists, where, how, uh, who owns the internet and how does it work? So he's an expert in servers and routers and cables. We will see a bit of his work. I strongly suggest um, to watch this dark internet topologies video because what Dania uh, did was to um, basically make a mapping of actually how the data and information from our computers um, are um, going and passing through our data and requests uh, um, in a, uh, on a sort of um, uh, very complex systems of, um, of um, um, servers and cables and uh, antennas and all this kind of thing. We will see a bit in details, but before I go into the next slide and share the work of Dania, um, I like that in opposition to what we said, the hacker is a researcher that actually wants to know more in order to extract information and also to understand uh, what's behind technology. Well, um, another definition, um, I, I, it's, it's opposite to um, the definition of a cyborg for Andrew, Andrew Yeman, uh, that when a person gives self-control over to a computer and accept the default options without question, so without a critical approach to technology, that person becomes a cyborg. Um, with that in mind, okay, let's see then. Um, so uh, the point is then how can systems and of exploitation hidden inside technology uh, can be exposed? And to answer this question, we will see two examples. Uh, one again um, from Dania. This is not really a, an artwork from Dania. It's like a part of his research. Um, so what we can see here um, is a very interesting map um, showing uh, the internet. So uh, part of the internet. Um, I, I kind of quote was uh, what Dania uh, said in that video, uh, dark internet topology. Um, the internet, the biggest machine, um, a global machine ever built by humanity, uh, it is. it seems it feels an entity without perimeters. Uh, it is pervasive, it's everywhere, and we tend to believe that the internet is a sort of a public domain thing, is our thing, and it's without a body. But actually, uh, the, phys the physicality of the internet, although hidden, remote, and often under the sea, um, it's actually existing. And it's actually mainly owned by private corporation and government who decide uh, it's functioning according to their political and business agenda. So what we see here are, it's a map of uh, submarine cables, um, internet cables connecting this region. And the important information here, and it's a result of the research of da uh, Dania, is that uh, all these cables are private. This, this list you can see are private corporation owning those cables. And so deciding everything around those cables. Um, so, and all through those cables, our internet queries are traveling. And um, yeah, so, and so it's absolutely not a neutral uh, space, uh, the internet and um, we are not, we have actually to question and not accept the fall. Again, watch that video because uh, the technology for understanding, I don't say that mapping this thing is uh, easy and straightforward way. But at the same time, the for understanding and for mapping certain technologies like the internet, actually um, it's pretty understandable, especially when Dania is explaining it because uh, most of the technology uh, among routers and servers 
it's uh, very old. And so for us, it's somehow more understandable. I mean, uh, all the uh, not super hidden part of the information that we can gather. Um, it's more understandable uh, somehow. Uh, it's more easy to mock the internet than to understand other consumer products and how they work in exploiting their users, which is somehow the introduction of the next case studies. Um, the next case studies um, for which I, first of all, uh, yeah, I just, uh, it, which is based on Alexa. Um, Alexa, it was a groundbreaking technology when it came out in the beginning of 2010 to 2013. Um, is a virtual assistant uh, that has been uh, produced and distributed by Amazon. Um, it's a virtual assistant based on a polished speech synthesizer voice uh, bought by Amazon. And uh, beyond many, it's a couple of many uh, tasks. It's like 15 centimeters high. It's a little box. This is the, the one that we see here. It's the original model. So now the technology looks a bit different, but it's still like a cylinder somehow. Um, it is capable of uh, many tasks, such voice interaction, music playback. It's, uh, uh, it can do to the list, it could setting alarms, uh, responding to questions, providing weather forecasts uh, on uh, forecasts on traffic sport, real time information, etc. And Alexa can also control several smart devices um, using itself as a home automation system. And uh, the, um, the, the interaction with the tool is mainly uh, through voice. Uh, so this is the tool, uh, which of course, um, yeah, so it's a uh, super, it's a mass consumer product. Um, so I don't actually know the numbers, uh, how many householders have uh, Alexa in the various regions, but I guess, um, it's uh, pretty diffused. Um, I've been actually investigated by this couple of artists, Kate Crawford and Vladan Yoller. So inside Alexa, there is uh, an AI that actually is uh, used uh, not only for the voice, but also for automatizing a certain um, activities. Uh, among the, for example, uh, skills or things that uh, Alexa can do, like also buying things online, buying things in Amazon, acquiring information and responding uh, or activating um, devices in a home. So this um, outstanding project is from 2018 is actually a research, is what you see, it's a poster. And it's a poster and a series of <laughs> essays. Um, and and uh, beside the outstanding uh, graphic uh, design, I would say, I mean, I love it. Um, the uh, the work that this year artist did was to go exploring and exploding what happens basically when we uh, send a request to um, to Alexa. And what you can see here, it's an extreme, I mean, in this case, it's not just one call, it's actually trying to mapping all the things that Alexa can do. And basically uh, what we are seeing, it's uh, a bit of an explosion of this black box of Alexa, and at the same time, a representation of its business model. And this is um, uh, very outstanding, in my opinion, the work that they did, because in, Understanding how it works, they also understood uh, the uh, endless number of touch points uh, in which Alexa, in doing Alexa, generate and extract, especially generate value for its stakeholders, including oh, like Amazon and um, many other uh, private corporations, and extract values from the planet, from the users. Um, this the map that we see here. It's a very um, strong map of um, exploitation and uh, value extraction. So uh, in the website you find the map, which is uh, super big. You can also print it uh, because they have. Um, yeah, you can download for free the um, 
the old map um, and print it on a large size. And this is like something to have on a wall and to look at and to discuss about it uh, uh, um, more like frequently. And there are um, uh, many essays that actually explain all this hyper complicated uh, um, analysis and map. I'd like to uh, read a few um, steps, a uh, few passages of the um, of this. Um, so um, of the first the, the 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 first essay. So a cylinder sits in a room, and in the meanwhile, I want to scroll a bit inside so you can have. Um, um, a cylinder sits in a room. It is impassive, smooth simple and small. A woman walks into the room, uh, carrying a sleeping child in her heart. And she addresses the cylinder. Alexa, turn on the, high, the whole light. Uh, the cylinder springs into life. Okay, the room lights up. The woman makes a nodding gesture and carries the child upstairs. This is an interaction with Amazon Echo device, Alexa. A brief comment and the response uh, is the most common form of engagement with this consumer voice enabled AI device. But in this fleeting moment of interaction, a vast matrix of capability is invoked. Interlaced chain of resource and extractions, human labor and algorithmic process, uh, processing across networks of mining, logistics, distribution, prediction, and optimization. The scale of this system is almost beyond human imagining. How can be, we begin to see, to, to grasp its immensity and complexity as a connected form? So um, actually, yeah, again, it's a very passionate reading, uh, the 21st essays that analyze this inimaginable complexity behind this product. Um, it's integrated on this website. But uh, I think it's uh, um, mind-blowing, mind-blowing the work that they did in showing up um, this, uh, the hidden, hidden system of exploitation of the planet, of the people, everything behind this simple, cool tool. Um, uh, yeah. Going back, uh, I'm gonna be, I'm, I'm a bit late, so I go a bit faster. Um, let's, I, I wanna, um, you know, in, between exposing and mobilizing people, I'd like to pass through this, uh, to this project as Julian Oliver and uh, Gordon Savicic. Julian Oliver, also a, a critical engineer. Uh, I really like uh, the project that he did. This project um, is a clever one, simple, and it's per million. So the per million, uh, it's both a protest tool and a measurement reference, um, centering what might be the most important number of our time. So what we see here in this sort of picture with this clearly people demonstrating uh, somewhere, um, um, they're showing in their phone um, the, this amount of carbon dioxide in our planet atmosphere. This amount is a constantly changing and unfortunately constantly growing number um, that of course it's somehow the only real um, tool we have for appreciating and learning and understanding the real quality of our hair or how is getting bad the quality of our air through time? So the website is pretty simple. If you check, you go um, in this. Uh, so this website allows also, there's also an app that you can actually, a uh, simple, simple app uh, that you can install in your phone for basically doing what we were saying before, like having uh, this number um, picture, pictured uh, from your phone and, um, so this tool um, is uh, representing the Keeling curve, a graph uh, of the accumulation of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere from a monitoring station uh, in Hawaii. This monitoring station is running since 
uh, the 60s. Uh, and actually, uh, it's actually the most reliable information we have about the um, change in the quality of our hair. This is a fantastic. Um, yeah, so that's actually the graphic that uh, the um, a killing curve um, represented. So the, 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 this, uh, the drawn has drawn since the 60s uh, till now. So um, I think this tool, um, it's an interesting, simple, uh, clever idea for um, uh, get uh, people informed and also have um, exposing, for example, in the protest, in, in the context of a protest to exposing um, precise scientific data uh, about um, uh, climate uh, action. Um, with the protest, yeah, so the thing is, uh, how can we protest? This is a question that uh, I personally find extremely interesting, and then there's always, um, uh, like, the more uh, societal problems, especially, so in those uh, entrenched with technologies and internet and uh, future foresight are becoming weird and complex and uh, uh, bigger. Uh, understanding how we can protest against certain uh, problems is um, it's really complicated. And it's uh, the, uh, the thing I guess that uh, creative activism is trying to uh, solicit is to um, develop and nurture a creative approach to understand exactly that. How can we protest? Um, of course, um, it's worth mentioning a series of uh, global online and offline uh, mobilization approach by mentioning global movements like Extinction Rebellion, um, as a UK headquartered global environmental movement um, that use uh, nonviolent civil disobedience to compel government's action to avoid tipping point in the climate system, biodiversity loss, and the risk of social and ecological collapses. The map of uh, Extinction Rebellion uh, covers the entire planet. Um, there is also a, um, a Extinction Rebellion Ugandan group. Um, and I think that uh, this, uh, I mean, of course, it's interesting what they do. They're using art for engaging. Also, this, um, they have an artistic approach for engaging um, um, more activists in their extremely large community uh, movement. And um, I suggest you have a look on, I mean, they think that their website, for example, which is one of the core um, spot for following um, Extinction Rebellion. It's very well done and clear and synthetic. Uh, like, um, I think it's a good case studies for to study more, to see more in details, for um, see how a good website for engaging in moments uh, could be um, done. Um, very briefly, I mean, uh, another good, like an important example is the social movement Me Too an awareness campaign uh, against sexual abuse, sexual harassment, and rape culture, in which people publicize their experience of sexual abuse or sexual harassment for the purpose of empowering uh, victims of uh, sexual abuse and, of course, denounce um, perpetrators. Um, Black Lives Matter, um, decentralized political and social movement that seek uh, to highlight racism, discrimination, racial inequality experienced by Black people and promote anti-racism. The primary concerns are incidents of police brutality and racially motivated violence against Black people. So um, for these three big movements, um, we can see that uh, the mobilization has been equally online and offline. So people go in the street and people through online campaigning raise awareness, create um, the physical part uh, that then goes in the street in various um, contexts and cities in the world. What is interesting in creative activism is that we can uh, uh, spot uh, other approaches. 
uh, besides that, or approaches which are supportive, of course, also of this, um, and that deploy technology and creativity and uh, very often humor and fun for um, yeah, exposing and criticizing phenomena. So um, yeah, I would start with anonymous, um, very briefly, and the website defacement. So the website defacement is an attack on a website that changes the visual appearance of a website or of a web page for a certain time. Let's say until the attack uh, isn't um, somehow um, contrasted by uh, the real owner of the website. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, so um, what you can see here is a message from Anonymous that um, basically found ways for uh, def defacing uh, a huge number of websites in China in 2000, beginning of 2010. And uh, in order to uh, criticize the country's government for its repressive policies um, to um, somehow obscure and control information in the country. So uh, indeed, China has one of the most comprehensive web surveillance system in the world, known as the Great Firewall of China. Um, that actually is there for, to reinforce uh, a broader social control. So basically, um, the system monitors where Chinese people can go online and what they can talk about and discuss about. Um, so the, on these defaced pages, the anonymous attackers uh, posted this information and posted ways for um, navigating without uh, outside this great firewall uh, of China, uh, which are VPNs or Tor, uh, which is uh, um, uh, like a browser that uh, actually allows to um, have um, a more un un untraced, unmapped um, network for uh, uh, social for information and. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so basically anonymous attackers posted links to advice uh, that uh, could help people avoid official scrutiny of what they do and say online. And so the store and VPNs. Um, so the only thing is that all this advice is, uh, that's pretty weird, we're put in English. Uh, the most of information were um, shared in English. So uh, it always been, in this case, a question of uh, if that uh, warning was actually of real help. Uh, but definitely, um, uh, yeah, an interesting and um, an interesting, useful um, exercise against the uh, Chinese government. Um, I'd like to uh, show another approach. So before, um, yeah, uh, we talked about the, the sabotaging. And um, although this uh, airline company, um, it would not uh, sound particularly relevant uh, in, um, in East Africa, but because uh, the, um, yeah, it's like, uh, it's actually one of the biggest uh, airline companies um, on a global level, but it's uh, mainly operating in Europe. And it's named Ryanair. And what you can see here, uh, it's actually um, a work by uh, Brandalism, uh, a billboard uh, that in this photo is in the act of being put it in on. Um, it's an artist collective uh, from UK that engages in subvertising and protest art. So uh, the subvertising is the practice of making spoofs and parodies of corporate and political advertising. So uh, in particular, the comments of uh, vandalism here uh, is the case, and actually they went through um, also other uh, airline companies like uh, Lufthansa and many others. Um, their intention here is actually to somehow fight against 
the constant promotion of uh, airlines um, in our cities uh, because um, this, yeah, so and mentioning instead uh, the um, dramatic impact that uh, uh, this the, the, the flying is actually having on our planet, which is never mentioned. So the real point um, in in um, in 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 this in the, in details, the thing is that uh, uh, as in Europe we have this uh, policy uh, in most of countries we don't have it in Germany actually uh, we have a policy against um, that are uh, somehow um, impeding uh, multinational tobacco um, multinational of tobacco to advertise tobacco because tobacco kills. Or um, I mean, in Germany, tobacco like tobacco is on billboard, um, but at least we have on tobacco uh, strong indications of the risks that uh, a smoker can take uh, is taking while smoking. So um, the claim of uh, vandalism is like okay, um, the, the the dark side of flying is not at all uh, illustrated in in the advertising of. Um, 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 of uh, airline marketing, uh, airline marketing, and this um, this work, uh, their work is actually meant to uh, give an example <laughs> of um, how this uh, ban of fossil ads should be um, um, should be portrayed. And these posters, of course, are lasting in public spaces for unfortunately quite a short time, but enough to uh, raise awareness and end up on. Uh, you know, newspapers and so on, because the actions um, they are able to put up are uh, uh, pretty extensive. And um, like this one, uh, I think has been, I don't know, perhaps it was, um, yeah, this um, subvertising uh, on uh, airline marketing uh, has been actually spread uh, on the European level for um, it, during 2022. And um, so it, it gained attention in many ways and raise awareness on people. Yeah, hey, think when you fly, you're also destroying the planet and not just uh, enjoying your time uh, and going seeing um, uh, amazing places. Um, so um, another, I mean, I'm a bit late. But uh, I really want to show you the last three projects. I think they're just three. Yeah. So this is um, an interesting, I mean, a project I love about, uh, yeah, an activist project, uh, which is a perfect example of a prank. Um, so a little bit of uh, background information. Um, the background information is, um, about uh, a disaster, uh, the Bhopal disaster, uh, known as the Bhopal gas tragedy, happened in 1984 uh, at a pesticide plant in Bhopal in India. Um, the Bhopal disaster is considered the worst industrial disaster ever, affecting over 500,000 people in nearby towns who were exposed to a uh, highly toxic gas. So the owner, the responsible for the disaster uh, was the uh, Dow Chemical Company, an American multinational corporation among uh, the three largest uh, chemical producers in the world. Um, so the estimated that toll uh, is uh, vary, but the official count is like um, uh, more than 2,000 people immediate that than um, 550,000 more people injured, um, 40,000, like numbers, incredible numbers. So the, um, the trial regarding this disaster between the victims, this countless number of victims and the responsible, the Dow Chemical Company, who owned the, um, uh, um, the entire plant system, um, lasted 20 years. Because somehow this uh, chemical company never admitted their responsibility in this, never. Um, so, uh, and this uh, is the moment in which this uh, crazy, I'd say, 
group of activists actually came uh, into uh, the scene uh, in this uh, Bhopal, uh, Bhopal disaster. So uh, the Yasmen is the duo, um, an American duo, that actually um, works, uh, wh whose activist approach is actually the, the one of inter-infiltrating in official uh, media settings, uh, uh, impersonating um, fake uh, representatives of, uh, for example, in this case, the, uh, this um, Dow Chemical Company. So um, indeed, uh, Andy Bilchbaum, one of the two Yasmen, uh, infiltrated in, um, in BBC uh, World Service in 2004, um, and convincingly pretended to be that representative of Dow Chemical, Jude Finisterra, and basically he stated to the entire world at the BBC uh, World Service that Dow Chemical was taking the entire responsibility and was ready to give to the 500,000 uh, injured people 12 billion of euros. So I think it's nice to watch a couple of minutes of this and um, enjoy a bit of Frank. We can't hear the sound, actually. Uh, Sabina, we can't hear the sound. Uh, hmm. It's a pity. How can I do that? Hmm. Uh, can you hear now? No. Any changes? No. Nothing changes? Yeah. Um, Wait a second, there's an idea. It's a pity, I wanna read it. Uh, can you hear me now? No. Sorry, we can hear you, but not to the video. Uh, I really uh, don't know how, now, 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 when I search. Or your computer sound. And now, when we acquired Union Carbide, no, now it's fine. Yes. Oh, okay, perfect. That was. Can you also hear my voice? Yes. Well, joining us live from Paris now is Jude Finstera. He's a spokesman for Dow Chemicals, which took over Union Carbide. Uh, good morning to you. Um, a day of commemoration in Bhopal. Do you now accept? responsibility for what happened. Steve, yes. T today is a great day for all of us at Dow and I think for millions of people around the world as well. It's 20 years since the disaster and today I'm very, very happy to announce that for the first time Dow is accepting full responsibility for the Bhopal catastrophe. We have a 12 billion dollar plan to finally, at long last, fully compensate the victims, including the 120,000 who may need medical care for their entire lives, and to fully and swiftly remediate the Bhopal plant site. Now, when we acquired Union Carbide three years ago, we knew what we were getting, and it's worth $12 billion. $12 billion. We have resolved to liquidate Union Carbide, this nightmare for the world and this headache for Dow, and use the $12 billion to provide more than $500 per 
per victim, which is all that they've seen, a maximum of just about $500 per victim. It is not plenty good for an Indian, as one of our spokesperson persons unfortunately said a couple of years ago. In fact, it pays for one year of medical care. We will adequately compensate the victims. Uh, furthermore, we will perform a full and complete remediation of the Bhopal site, which, as you mentioned, has not been cleaned up. When Union Carbide abandoned the site 20 years ago, uh, or 16 years ago, they left tons of toxic waste, which continues, the site continues to be used as a playground by children. Uh, water continues to be uh, uh, drunk from the, the groundwater underneath. It's a mess, Steve. And it's, it's a mess, Adele. certainly, uh, Jude. That, that's good news that you have finally accepted responsibility. Uh, some people would say too late. It's three years, yes. almost four years on. Um, how soon is your money going to make a difference to the people in Bhopal? Well, as soon as we can get it to them, Steve. Uh, we've begun the process of liquidating Union Carbide. Um, this is, as you mentioned, late, but it's the only thing we can do. When we acquired Union Carbide, we did settle their liabilities in the United States immediately. And we are now, three years later, prepared to do the same in India. We should have done it three years ago. We are doing it now. Um, I would say that it's better late than never. And I would also like to say that this is no small matter, Steve. This is the first time in history that a publicly owned company of anything near the size of Dow has um, performed an action which is significantly against its bottom line simply because it's the right thing to do. And our shareholders may take a bit of a hit, Steve, but I think that if they're anything like me, they will be ecstatic to be part of such a historic occasion of doing right by the... So I am um, interrupting uh, because I guess the message uh, went through. Um, so the, this Yasmin actually publicly... Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay, okay. Um, this uh, Yasmin actually uh, made a public statement. Uh, this uh, it's like simply um, impossible, incredible, and that would be actually the only the right thing to do. Um, it has an influence, of course. This uh, this news influenced uh, the public opinion um, about Dow Chemical, although of course they never gave. 12 billion uh, in, uh, in reimbursement and compensations for the victims. Um, I guess it's, um, again, also Yasmin, it's an entire word of fun and uh, creativity and activism that should be um, further, um, the, the, I mean, the, you should, I suggest you to uh, dig into Yasmin work uh, a bit more. The fact of like, closing those uh, case studies um, with the press and uh, other uh, somehow, uh, you know, parodies and fiction um, and, and fictional um, artifacts for uh, conveying important messaging. Um, it opens up, I think, to, um, yeah, uh, the topic of uh, media, especially media literacy and investigation. So, uh, um defective uh working with uh, there's a great distinction of course for between the work of yes men and um i don't know this ai generated fake uh, of Pope francis um this is just hilarious um this is uh, an image generated with no author found on reddit this year generated with mid journey that actually has been taken for real uh, by most of the people, uh, incredibly. And um, so the impact of such uh, fake, uh, I mean, we of course know about deep fake in general and uh, the impact of uh, AI um, generated videos and images uh, actually it's uh, very far from uh, the examples of uh, pranks that we have just seen. Um, so, um, I don't know, uh, might be, um, interesting, um, I don't have, have a mentimeter, but, um, and I can also not see you now, um, but it would be interesting to, um, understand, uh, if you use AI, for example, 
uh, or if you, uh, yeah, if you uh, have experienced um, AI based tools in the last, let's say, year, because most of the more powerful products came out this year, actually. So I'm wondering if anybody um, has, um, what I, I didn't create um, a Mentimeter for that. So if anybody wants to say something about it or to write uh, if, um, and I, okay, uh, Yara says we have an AI version of Romeo. Ah, okay, taking notes with us here. Um, Sorry, that's uh, uh, in the app, he added like a note taking um, AI that I noticed in I, case message. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I really love it. Okay. Uh, so and uh, does it listen or what does it do? Um, uh, what I see it doing actually, yeah, exactly, is like just transcribing for now. I don't know if it, uh, maybe Romeo tried it before and it's taking screenshots of some things. So I guess it's like, yeah, it can it can probably highlight key points and things like that, what it says. But Very interesting. I'm interested also to not to hear from the other, everyone else, if they're using AI, what, what they know about AI. If anyone can share their... Um. It, um, yeah, that somehow uh, it's probably um, in the flow of um, uh, my content maybe now it's, um, yeah, good point. Does anybody use a chat GPT and for what also? Maybe we can also have I... a look at yeah, who's talking? Oh yes, I I've used a couple of um, AI systems or programs. Um, of course, I have tried uh, ChatGPT. I've also tried Google's Bot. Um, but I think the AIs that I use most uh, these days are like Adobe Firefly. It's still in its beta. Uh, it's uh -huh. generative AI, but basically instead of words, which is what ChatGPT does, you can insert an input and ask it to, for example, generate an image. So basically almost like what we saw with the pop image, but what it does is that it sort of has a restraint and it doesn't uh, create image of real human beings and, and stuff like that. But it's really interesting how, for example, people can use it to generate different video backgrounds if they're editing videos and stuff like that. So um, yeah, that's an AI that I have used. I've tried Mid Journey as well um yeah interesting stuff <laughs> um yeah i think it comes to the question of like the blood lines between reality and what is not uh and, and all of that yeah uh interesting we um um yeah in, in, in the second time um we used a uh, mid journey once in our workshop at disruption network in an interesting way that actually uh, in a way that is not in any case um, misleading the observer and uh, having the impression of looking at something that is it real, is not real, but it's like clearly unreal, but helpful for visualizing concepts, futuristic concepts. Um, and then, yeah, somehow create uh, like co generated concepts and uh, creating a connection. But I will put this uh, workshop in uh, in the ASNET resources. Um, unfortunately, there's no time to talk about it here, but it's interesting, especially if you use um, AI um, for visual generation, I think that that, uh, that tool would be uh, interesting um, in your hub. I mean, you can um, have a look. What I'd like to do before, um, because I, I'm a bit late, I uh, want to take, five more minutes and then um, uh, close my part, is this uh, digital empire uh, kit. So the digital empire kit is like um, the uh, project from Tactical. Um, so like uh, NGO and in my opinion, Think Tank Research Center in Berlin that actually 
works uh, on investigation contents and in general in designing tools that are uh, doing that like empowering people uh, in uh, getting more knowledgeable in all the problems that we just discussed today one very well done uh, kit is this digital inquirer um it's actually many many languages um and so we will check it quickly the digital inquirer is someone who knows how to identify and navigate misinformation find collect analyze reliable information share information in a safe way because at the basis of all the projects we have sent today there's definitely a strong needs and the strong um endeavor in finding the truth and uh, behind all uh, distractions and hidden systems, finding the truth and make it known. So the first step is like identifying what is the truth. And this is um, more and more complicated, uh, the more our internet get complexified and the media sphere gets uh, a, a bad place <laughs> for everybody at every age. Um, the Digital Inquirer is um, yeah, an interesting tool that is made of modules, actually. It's conceived as a course uh, that everybody can take for free uh, in many different languages. And uh, every of the modules is actually providing a next level of awareness and how to navigate and find information online. So we'll just go on the first uh, one element. So it's really lovely. Um, build your digital inquirer mindset. There's not even needs of, um, of uh, basically register, create uh, profiles, it's just straightforward. Um, and uh, nice also how it is uh, guiding um, the, um, the user into a very uh, beautiful learning experience. Um, and uh, yeah, for example, uh, this is of course uh, entry level and then the complexity of the self-checking questions that the, the digital inquiry key provides to the learner uh, is grow, are growing. And then um, how do you keep your digital information safe to access apps, website information or services? And um, you know, it's really worth it to make those tests in a very honest, honest way uh, and see also make a self-assessment. Okay, how good I am, how much careful I am when I search for information, when I keep my, my data safe. So, um, um, yeah, so this is really, really a big resource that I also, I mean, I uh, want to take time to... Uh, make myself very much uh, uh, in details um, because I feel that uh, threats and um, um, threats are like becoming more and more complicated to tackle in our uh, online world and digital life. So uh, I wanna quickly close with uh, one last project. Uh, so yeah, also for uh, making, um, for uh, developing uh, a capacity, capability for analyzing and spotting hopes and fakes and, uh, you know, uh, misleading information. There's also an interesting part in the digital inquiry related to the image. This digital inquiry is from 2020. 2020? Yeah. Uh, so um, all the mid-journey thing and so on, we need an update for sure. <laughs> but I guess that instead, anyway, the information, the mindset for a digital a proper digital, a safe digital inquiry, it wouldn't change even if the technology explodes uh, even more than it is now. So it's perhaps not so connected with the advancement of digital technologies, but this with this critical mindset and that we discussed throughout the uh, entire day. This, I don't have time for going that much in details, but this is a similar kit, um, which is more uh, made for showing methodologies for investigation. So um, it's uh, less of a course, is more of a set of um, methodologies that you can use for searching information. We, uh, um, it's nice what they say, you are, we are already uh, investigators, 
And so it does not separation between us and an investigator, uh, except the fact of uh, um, using um, useful tools, well done tools for um, yeah, validating uh, and uh, validating our inquiries and um, uh, investigating the truth. I want to stop here uh, with my slides. I hope uh, you're still alive. And um, what I wanted to do, it was a little. So, first of all, if you have questions, otherwise, I have a question. <laughs> okay, let's go for my question. I, I, uh, I have a question. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. And I think it goes back to the to one of the slides on subvertising. My yes. question is, how legal is that in the framework of uh, freedom to speech? Um, because I think it, 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 to me, it sort of falls under vandalization <laughs> of, uh, I, I don't know how is that, you know, legal in a sense? Uh, well, it's not legal. <laughs> um, especially, I mean, um, you know, we have checked a series of, um, this is also not really legal, right? Impersonating someone else is not legal. Um, putting, you know, um, uh, you know, creating cheat storms in using a public space, make fake uh, this uh, vandalism, uh, also named. Yeah, it's like a protesting vandalism. Um, it's it's not legal. So, um, but also, you know, most of the cases, uh, this is also not legal. This is not forcibly legal. Um, all of these activities are, although they're peaceful, but in in most of the cases, they're really at the border of legality for certain systems. And so, um, uh, you know, um, with few exceptions in the world of art, most of the, like a lot of this, um, also website, website defacement is not legal. Um, it's not that we are talking about um, uh, performing illegal things, but definitely in certain activity, in certain actions, it's important to tackle inspiration and, of course, to always assess the risk of certain actions. Um, there was, um, there was, there was, um, Stephen uh, wanted to say something, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Even thank, if, yeah. yeah, thank you, Sabina. And um, yeah, and I guess I, I also wanted to comment, I, I guess, to what um, Jixana was also saying. Um, yes, of course, um, in, in a technical way, most of these kinds of social activism, social hacktivism type things are not legal, but they also take place within frameworks of um, the legal ability, for example, to demonstrate or to protest something. Um, and not, not all laws necessarily are congruent with each, each other. And I think the difference between something that is making a statement of, um, you know, exposing something which is inherently wrong, or we talk about whistleblowers a lot. Uh, Disruption Lab Network, for example, deals a lot with whistleblowers and the whole act of whistleblowing. Um, it's a question of whether there's something behind it that is actually uh, for a certain kind of a, a good um, that when we talk about vandalism and acts of violence, those are legal acts which tend to be, let's say, um, against the good <laughs> of society. Like um, we don't murder people. We also don't want to have disinformation and misinformation um, that incites violence. Um, so it's a question of constructing messages in order for people to be aware of certain wrongs or certain issues. 
Um, but you know, you're right, Jixana, there's, 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 there's always a fine line between these, these kinds of things, right? Like what forces one to do, to take a certain action. The question that I had um, is that, of course, most of the things that Sabina has been presenting are, um, you know, let's say very Western or European uh, type of actions, for example, against climate catastrophe scenarios. Um, and I, I'm curious to know, like, how you guys who are in South Sudan, in Uganda, uh, you know, see these kinds of things or how you uh, act or react to them. Because, of course, the things that are being protested in, in Europe, um, they're things um, like, you know, the CO2 issue and climate, these are things which affect um, people in Uganda and South Sudan disproportionately, but you are not responsible for it. You are not the emitters of these gases. You are not the creators of the mass amounts of electronic uh, pollution uh, and so on. Um, so um, some of you are working on, you know, upcycling pro projects, looking at electronic waste and all that. But um, if, if you would engage in a certain form of this, this type of social activism, I, I wonder who would be your audience. Um, just, just I'd, I'd love, I'd love to hear from some of you how how you see these kinds of things from your context, your perspective. Um, it was very briefly mentioned that that there is an extinction rebellion uh, movement in Uganda. We here in Europe, we hear at little, little, little bits and pieces of that, but very little. So maybe just before we take our short break, because I'm really excited to listen and hear what Brian will be talking about, um, just from some of the people who haven't spoken yet, a little bit how you see this uh, type of, of, uh, of, of social activism. Wrong question. Anybody? Yeah, so I, I mean, you know, I'm wondering, at the, I see Celeste uh, here. Kigetso has joined us. Kigetso is also great activist uh, in our in our community. Uh, Salua, Yina, um, uh, Dava, you know, uh, what do you, you know, how do you guys look at this, the, these types of scenarios? And um, how do you look at the things that you do in a critical way vis-a-vis, um, -vis, you know, people who are, you are, uh, you know, sending your messages to? Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, well, if not, then maybe everyone will think about it. I, uh, and yeah, Jigsaw. Listen, listen, my network just broke a little bit while you were asking that question. So I don't know if you would mind repeating it just once more. Okay, well, I'm not gonna repeat the whole question, uh, but uh, basically I wanted to hear from some of the other people um, who are following the webinar um, about, how, about their own reception about these kinds of social and political activism that takes place in the West, in Europe, um, which, which is protesting environmental problems, for example, that affect you guys disproportionately more maybe than, than us, but we over here in the North were responsible for it. So we're destroying your environment. Um, you're not the perpetrators um, of this and, um, and and I, I and I just wonder, um, you know, if you were, if if you have, uh, you know, issues to protest that you would want to socially hack, you know, who would be your audience? Um, do we do we have people who listen, or do pe people care, you know, about um, this this kind of thing? I would just, you know, I'd lo love to hear a little bit 
uh, you know, some some response from others in the in the uh, in the group here. Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, question, and um, I mean we we come from environments where uh, there's a very an ever shrinking space for civic activism and engagement, and um, and but I would like to kind of just highlight uh, I don't know if Jackie is here because they do amazing work at uh, Mamara Sakit Village with engaging with the governments on how to introduce bills that you know better protect women and stuff like that. So it would have been really nice to, to hear about them. But I just want to quickly uh, highlight some examples of work that I've seen, whether globally or also locally. Um, I think also through our work and engagement with IFA policy, you have got into interface and also really learn about the extension rebellion um, protest uh, and also even like the movement here in Uganda. Um, and I think it's really interesting to to see these forms of actions that uh, communities or people are taking in order to raise awareness about certain issues. Um, I've also heard about like, you know, citizen assemblies, for example, in some parts of, you know, Europe where people come together to articulate exactly what kind of things they want to see done. In South Sudan, there's a new sort of movement. You, I think everyone probably have heard about uh, Anataban, but besides Anataban, there's a new group of uh, uh, activists that came together to form the, uh, I think it's called New Sabab, which means new youth. And the idea is to try to raise awareness about issues from governance to climate and all these issues that affect people in the country by mobilizing young country, uh, young people and protesting in, in different forms. So instead of protesting about issues of health, they protest about health while cleaning the environment in Juba, um, which is it's, it's an interesting way to protest because, you know, uh, usually when you protest, you are doing civil disobedience in forms where you are not doing something. In South Sudan, the people are actively cleaning environments or whatever while wearing t-shirts um, that are sending their message out about what they want to see. So I thought that was really interesting. And I also think that is genius in a way that, you know, I talked about how there's a very shrinking space for civic engagement. And, and things like this are also like a loophole in the system because the government doesn't maybe see that as active protesting um, instead of community service. So I think there's a lot of um, examples of campaigns uh, that are, of course, really different in, in, in form and, 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 and style. But also, I think also it is influenced by the context um, of South Sudan and, and where the people are, are from. So I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, from my end because I asked the question. Um, but of course, I want to pass the mic to everyone on the call to sort of give their thoughts on uh, on your question. Uh, um, there's uh, also Buga who wants to say something. Um, so, um, uh, just before you Vuga start, I wanted to, um, yeah, it would be ideal if in four minutes we could start, um, the second part of the, because it's, I know my fault, <laughs> I was a bit longer. Uh, so if we can perhaps keep this also debate also for the very end, uh, of the, uh, just right after the intervention of. Uh, Brian, but Buga, please, if you want to uh, speak, you're more than welcome. Okay, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, me um, adding on to what Shakana has said, uh, if you look at the South Sudan and, uh, and currently it is hard for us to, to do uh, physical um, uh, practice and, uh, and which uh, I'm looking to the best way that we can do at least giving information awareness to community is uh, using a digital that's why it's all the hubs uh now come up we're uh, looking to how do we use uh, a, a digital so that we can address a local issue in the community i think uh we pick much using the hashtag whereby 
to tackle the issue that's really hindered in the country so that people will uh, actually have uh, a virtual uh, communication that we talk about the things happen in the countries and like if the young people come together with a hashtag saying we don't want this and we want change we we, we formulate a hashtag i think that would be more easy and uh, going to the street and uh, get harm so basically to me i take like a digital it's a uh, one way out to for us to also put our voice into the matter that really can help us so uh, over that's my little comment i i wanted to put on Thank you for the comment very much. Um, so um, just to keep up the conversation because it might you know, get a bit, uh, more of a debate, uh, I would like to propose not to do the um, break now, but to actually welcome uh, uh, Brian uh, Bamani in the, like to open uh, his camera and uh, yeah, to uh, go straight to the second Part and uh, hello, listen to um, the uh, and in, hello. Thank you very much for joining us, really. Um, yes. So um, I'm gonna say two words about you, and then uh, it would be very nice to yeah let uh, you uh, tell us uh, about your work, and if you wanna make us listen some music, we won't say no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have, sorry, I opened with my uh, well done note. Um, and, 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 um, yes. Um, so uh, Brian has been already introduced in the uh, previous uh, weeks in the chat. Um, is a musician known as Afro Rock, um, East African pioneer based in Kampala and known for pushing artistic boundaries. He, he plays mainly electronic music and you could say techno-ish music. You will tell us more about your genre because uh, definitely not an easy thing to do, final definition. Um, so uh, yeah, I think an interesting, important aspect for this uh, day is that uh, hailing from Uganda, you nurtured your fascination for electronic and music, and ultimately teaching uh, yourself electronics, programming, and craftsmanship through online resources. So um, your breakthrough came with the DIY modular synthesizer. Then we will also perhaps understand a bit what is a synthesizer. Um, and then somehow you reshaped the um, the idea of East African music technology, I believe. Um, so your Afrorax homemade instruments offered an affordable alternative to the Eurorack. You will tell us more what is that. And that helped you to gain international uh, attention. Also uh, from manu major, major manufacturer uh, and also major manufacturer recognition. Um, beyond uh, your international impact, Brian, uh, remains deeply rooted in his community, mentoring aspiring artists and electronics enthusiasts in East Africa. I'll stop here and I mute myself and I very look forward to know you to know more uh, about uh, your work from your mouth. And thank you very much again for being with us. Uh, thank you. I hope everyone can hear me because I was having some technical issues like all the time. Uh, I can hear me. Okay, yes. cool. uh, can you? Okay, okay, thank you. Um, my name is Bamanya Brian. Uh, my artist name, which more people outside New Ghana know, is um. Afro rock, uh, Afro rock because um, like like they introduced me. There's um, I work with modular synthesizers. Modular synthesizers are uh, like electronic music equipment for making 
sounds <laughs> really and they use them for making like music and uh performance and stuff like that uh and the commercial format of modular synthesizers is called uh euro rock you know euro rock <laughs> uh so i mean when i picked interest in doing this i said like why why and I'm, I'm an african why would i <laughs> use a euro rock you know so uh, that's why i picked the name and called myself afro rock um i've always been interested in uh technology uh and music you know i uh, from a pretty young age as always curious about how like technology works how anything really because they were, <laughs> my parents would buy me like a toy you know these toys like uh, car toys and everything and it would be like a car for one day and the rest of the days, the hours, it's already in, in bits and pieces, you know, because I wanted to see like the motors inside, the batteries and how everything worked. That that was always me. Like, um, even my parents right now was like, they see the journey that I've taken and what I've eventually become. They're like, you know, no wonder. It's what you've always been. Like from a young age, you, you're always interested in wires and stuff like that. So uh, most people kind of outgrow that phase. You know, most boys, they like to open up stuff and see how it works at that age, you know, when you're like six years. But I kind of never outgrew it. Went to school and, you know, all the time I'll be like in the library reading books about physics and electronics. And, you know, I pretty much lost interest in everything else apart from that, you know. So... But I was always um, interested in finding out how, how I can, you know, how I can make things in my own context, you know. I'd always ask myself, how do the Chinese make, you know, it's made in China, made in the US, made in Canada. How do these people come up with these things, you know, because they're also human beings like us. They're also, that was always my quest. But my knowledge was always limited. My resources are always limited. I didn't have access to like a lab where I would go and find the electronic equipment or this test equipment or stuff like that. So, but when I had access to internet, like in secondary school, eventually up to like university, I started reading a lot about, uh, if you've heard of things like transistors, uh, these are electronic parts, transistors and um uh, I have some of them here. I don't know if you can, if the the camera can. You know, electronic parts which look like this. You you find them in many things, like you know, radios, and all kinds of you know, equipment. So I started putting the bits and pieces together, and um, my 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 area of interest was mainly music. I wanted to find a way to make my uh, my knowledge practical in uh, the space of music. So I can see many similarities with what you what 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 you've been discussing. I would actually consider myself like a, a, a like a like a hacker in a way, you know, because I always want to know how things work so that I can make my own uh, version of these things. That is like a short, <laughs> I think, introduction of uh, who I am. I do so many things. Uh, but maybe I'll just show you a few of the like the things that I have here, which might be relevant to what you'd know. Um, this is a part of like DJ equipment that I've done. If you've ever seen like DJs playing music, you see the, them spinning this thing, you know. Um, it's it's made out of wood. Uh, and uh, if I open it inside you'll see the bits and pieces of like commercial stuff which has been cut up and wires which have been put together. Uh, stuff like, okay, the other part of it is um, is this. This is also made out of wood, but it has knobs and uh, things. And then inside it looks, uh, it looks like this, you know. Uh, it's all pretty much like, DIY stuff, you know. So, um, uh, I'd, 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 like, what inspires my work? I can understand 
the, the conversations that you guys are having in terms of climate and all of that and reusing things. And pretty much that's what inspires my work. Like I, I'm i always asking myself, like in the last few years, everyone in the technology industry has been like, you know, the world is running out of chips. Uh, especially after COVID and they could not make any new money cars and stuff like that. But if you look at what is being thrown away, you know, we have this consumerism of every year I must have a, a new phone, you know, then it breaks just, you know, a plastic piece off of it, it's still functional and you're like, now there's another phone, I need to buy that, you know. And all, we're throwing away a lot of um, functional technology. You know, something dies and it could be repaired. It's only like 5% of it that's dead and the rest of it is working. It's full of chips that are working. It's full of parts that can be recycled. But it is thrown away in the interest of like the company which makes to, uh, to which makes this technology in the interest of making more profits because they want to bring, you know, something new for you to buy. And eventually that's, what, that's what's destroying <laughs> our planet, you know, in terms of a lot of waste we are generating a lot of this stuff is you know like uh, like like uh, at my home i have a, um a microwave you know it was very functional then all of a sudden it died and i couldn't use it anymore but i have skills like in electronics i can repair stuff and all that so i opened it up and i found it it was only the keypad you know like the parts where you decide you want to cook something for like one minute, two minutes, three minutes, you know, it's all that had died, you know, the rest of the thing was working. So I just like uh, re-engineered something to bypass the keypad and up to today, I still use, you know, my microwave oven, you know, that's how things are wired today. Just a small part of the technology dies and it could easily be repaired. And then you have like 10 years of service out of that equipment, but that's not in the interest of the people that are manufacturing uh, that technology. So anyway, um, all of that is kind of what inspired what I'm doing, um, building my own music instruments. And uh, because sometimes I think like some of this stuff is like overpriced, you know, like all these modular synthesizers that I use, if you're to uh, buy that commercially, you would be in tens of thousands of dollars, you know. But because I've developed like those skills, uh to build the technology and to understand it and and even this conversation to 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 be a hacker i saw you showing examples of like uh anonymous and how they hack websites to put their messages like to be effective in your message and your actions even in climate change or whatever kind of hacking or hacktivism you want to do you have to first understand the system you have to first understand the technology you know Anonymous is known because they are actually very technical and they, are, they understand how to hack websites and they understand how to put their messages, you know? So uh, to even to recycle and to do all these things which are good for the environment, you really have to invest and in understand the technology and that you have to do it in your context, in your own context, you know, your local context. Like, uh, I have many ideas that <laughs> I'm working with right now. Like sometimes in my performances, I want to, you know, include like yeah, things like this. This is, a, this is a drum. It's a local drum, you know. And this is something that has existed in our traditions and cultures for like thousands of years. But sometimes I want to include it in my performances. But there's like there's no off-the-shelf solution that I can go to a shop and get, you know, like actuators and things that can play this drum and I connect it to my electronic equipment so that I can play it without touching it, you know, like things to play it automatically. I would have to develop that locally, you know, I'd have to find a way to hack this. So I believe it's the same for all these conversations of climate change. Um, the solutions that are relevant to Europe, America, they cannot be relevant to Africa. That's that's for sure. <laughs> like, even when you come and tell local people every time I've been to Europe to perform and I come back and it's like hot in the summers nowadays. And I tell people, man, like it's so hot in Europe, like people can't walk on the streets anymore. They're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> because we have a different climate here, you know, very moderate, like 
20, mid-20s most of the year around. So even people here have not yet understood a lot of those messages of, you know, but eventually even for the challenges that we're facing because of all of that, it's they have to have local solutions that uh, that are generated from within here, you know. That's the whole framework of like my work. I don't know if I've jumped <laughs> ahead of myself, but it's because I was kind of invested in the conversation which was going on. So yeah, um, if you want to see the kind of things that I make, um, for example, uh, I have a YouTube channel. It's called Afrorack in, in your time. Eventually, if you want to um, check out some of the things I'm talking about. Um, I'm trying to share the screen, so just a moment. Um, I might need to authorize you, make you co-host. Try to share the screen if you can't. Uh, I maybe also ask. Uh, yeah, to make okay. Yeah, I think now I can see yeah, what I want to share. Okay, your co-host. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. okay. Where okay. did that? <laughs> uh, so. Okay. Are uh, you seeing any screen yet or because? Uh, sorry, we can see your screen. Yeah, yeah, we we'll see the image. You see an image of something, yeah? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We see the video, but uh, yeah. Uh, uh, this, okay, okay. So, I mean, okay, okay, yeah. I think it's visible now. So I don't know if there's audio. I don't. But but we can't hear. Um, I, you you can't hear the sound. Exactly, and I I similar problem before, and I can tell you how I. Is it a YouTube video? This. Yes, 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 yes. So. I think I think the sound was there. Um, just the the video is is choppy. Uh, I think it's a connection uh, issue. Ah, maybe. Okay. Uh, but but anyway, basically, if you can see the image of, uh, if you can see the image that I'm sharing, uh, it's um, it's um, uh, that is a it's an electronic drum kit. You know, if if you've ever seen like drummers, the 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 um, um uh, okay let me okay uh so it's it's um a diy electronic music kit you know it's 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 like if you've ever seen drummers and and and, and the um, equipment they used to play basically drums but there's also the electronic version of like um electronic drums but it's super super expensive you know it's something which would cost like three thousand you know three thousand euros and of course if you're like uh, an, uh, a musician like in uganda you know and your desire is to like make music and play this kind of stuff it, it's something you have to buy either in europe or in you know america get your three thousand dollars or me my thinking is what about I get the skills and I understand how this thing works and actually build it myself, you know? And I built this, you know, it's it's very practical. If you can hear the, uh, 
if you can hear the sound that comes out of it, it's it's, it's um it's a sound of a real, you know. We can hear it. That's it's a yeah, it's it's a sound of a real drum kit, you know. But this is something I put together um, using. You know, like uh, if you watch the whole video eventually, in case you, you have the time, you know, uh, it's something I put together using like um, uh, plastic pipes. I just bought from my hardware store, you know, plastic pipes and screws and, you know, a, a few of, you know, like uh, electronic components. And then because of like the knowledge that I've acquired over time in electronics and reading about stuff, then I'm able to make this, you know. Uh, you can't see it? I'm not sure. Yes, we can see it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think at some point you can check it out really if you um, if you if you if you want to see uh, the details of, of, of uh, what it does. So um uh what else can I share with you guys? I, I don't find a link of this in your channel. I mean, it's not very quickly, at least, uh, of this um, of this uh, DIY battery system, so drummer system, sorry. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if you can share the link uh, somewhere, uh, would be nice. I noticed in the chat also, Dut was saying how you can use Python to produce sound connect it or port it to a DIY device, an Arduino using C. So, um, yeah, like, I don't know if Brian, you have, you're using any um, software or programming also with your hardware. Thank you. Uh, yeah, is uh, he fail? <laughs> so, um, yeah, we need to. We lost Brian. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, it's coming in. Echo. Hello, welcome back. Hi, I'm sorry, my my laptop crashed, so now I'm using my phone. Welcome uh, back. Yeah, but yeah, that's, my laptop just went down. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, yeah, there were a couple of questions um, for you. There yeah, a yeah. couple of questions. Uh, as a um, like response to your to the last project that you showed us, like uh, Dut is asking, um, I mean, uh, saying that uh, you can use Python and uh, to produce sound and uh, to port it to DIY device Arduino based using C. So if you have a comment or maybe you want to share, what is your tool chain? What kind of programming language you use for implementing your uh, devices? Well, I uh, because in trying to make like all this stuff, it, it's how you learn. It's I like I learned um like I really learned like how to program really during COVID because we we're all locked inside and we couldn't move out. If if you want to work with this kind of stuff, uh, which is relevant by the way, because I've also done a project in like uh, renewable energy, like solar. Th these I don't put them on my main channel because. For it is focused on music, but I've done like projects with renew renewable energy, solar, and all that stuff. If you're interested in doing those kind of projects, then you have to learn how to work with like microcontrollers, things like Arduino. Uh, there's so many. Uh, uh, I forget that like hundreds and hundreds of microcontrollers can work with different brands and all that. 
So uh, it's not even the, 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 because the languages, I wouldn't specify that you have to, I, I use Arduino, I use many other things. So I wouldn't specify to say you use this and use the other. It's basically, first of all, finding what you want to do, you know, they need, like it's what also pushes me to learn all these things. It's finding the need, like at one point I wanted to make a charge controller for my solar system, you know, but I didn't know how. So I had to read about like how charge controllers work. Then I realized I need a microcontroller for it. Then I needed to learn how to program that. So it begins with a need, then the need becomes the motivation for whatever you learn, whether you, the languages are like hundreds of languages you can, I mean, just go to the internet and find out what, what's, what suits your, uh, what's your, the purpose that you want to do, you know? Uh, but broader than that, really all these, I look at all of these as tools and that's why uh, my work is not limited to just music. It's people, like you said, they got to know me through the Afro Rock project where I built a modular synthesizer. And that's what everyone knows me for. And they started inviting me to perform in Europe, you know, for these shows and all that for the musical project. But beyond the music, I also have other projects that I do, which uh, can be relevant to like the discussion that, that you are having, you know, but it's all driven by like the need to learn to hack, okay, to hack, you know, all these systems which can be useful to us here in our very context. Then after, you know, understanding how they work, it will be easy for you after understanding how they work to make them relevant to what you want to do in your immediate neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, Brian, I have a quick question. Um, yeah. I was wondering what is the material that you use for the actual drum pads? Like I know some one of the top, <laughs> top was, was cracked or broken. I'm just wondering, are you are you making those yourself, or you've got materials that you've sort of upcycled, or are they just standard drum pads, just like so the hardware, the the hardware part? Yeah, yeah. The hardware part is I I really do a lot of experimenting. You know, I have um, uh, I I have you know, I have meters like sorry my, my laptop had a better screen than i mean better camera than this uh like this kind of thing you know for measuring stuff and have uh have a, an oscilloscope you know for doing all kinds of tests um so i really experiment a lot the drum pads that you saw is just um a rubber material that i cut it's not that it, it was broken i just cut it in that shape ah uh, okay yeah, no, it's just because it's it's hard to tell from the image like what the actual material was. I was curious, you know, like if it's a hard material or you say it's rubber, so mm -hmm. you get an idea, then you know of what what obviously what kind of sound you're going to get out of it. Oops. <laughs> Freeze again. Um. Yeah. Let's wait for. Um. Can come back and didn't um whole surface so okay. from like which which a bit yeah ah no it didn't yeah you're back <laughs> so yeah. yeah as i said i get um parts like this you know this this is a motor from a printer you know and it has these gears and sometimes I want to make like robotics and stuff like that. And sometimes it's, it's, it's I, you can't buy this stuff on eBay. If I'm to order something on eBay in Uganda, it's going to take like two weeks to reach here. And sometimes I want to implement an idea and try it immediately. So I have to find a DIY way of making that, you know, and that's what has like really pushed me to learn a lot of skills in, you know, like um, uh, how do, fabrication, like, uh, Solenoids, I, I have a solenoid here which I was using for some projects. Uh, it's it's like this part which I'm holding, the black part, it's a coil of wire, you know. You can buy that commercial, you can buy that commercially, you have, can order it off, off eBay, but you can also go downtown and buy the copper wire and just roll one for yourself. <laughs> so it's it's things like that. Like over time, I've kind of uh, accumulated skills to substitute uh, 
uh, the things I cannot access, like from eBay or parts stores in Europe. Of course, when I get a chance to go to Europe, I also buy things which are extremely out of, <laughs> you know, like the oscilloscope. I had to buy that in Germany when I visited Germany because you not get it any other way in Uganda. Yeah. But the rest of the stuff, I try to experiment and fabricate and uh, find something locally that can serve the same purpose. Yeah, so everything in that um, drum pad, which is so, it's just bits and pieces of rubber and piping for like, you know, sinks, uh, this plumbing, which they use for like sinks in the bathroom. And I joined them together. If you have time, you can watch the video because now I, I can't replay it and all that. But on my channel, you, you can see all that stuff. And it's what excites me to share, you know, uh, this kind of information because uh, sometimes people have ideas. They want to implement something, but they think, I need 2,000 euros to do this. You know, I have a project I want to do. We want to do a, a recycling project about this and that. We want to do this and that. But really, it's because all you've seen is people in Europe, Europe doing that and using the materials they have. So you have to think locally in everything that you do. Think locally. Think, what do I have in my immediate neighborhood that can be a substitute for whatever is out there? And then experiment. Experiment with all these things. Otherwise, all these nice ideas we have about the climate, about recycling, those stay just ideas. We'll talk and talk and there will be nothing practical until we find what's relevant and what's um, accessible within our communities to like make a change. You know? Yeah, thank you. Very inspirational. And um... Uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, if uh, anybody has questions uh, for Brian, think about. Um, so, because um, actually, while waiting for more questions to come up, there's something that um, I we discussed uh, last week. With Brian, we had a for uh, initial chat before, um, so to to um, yeah discuss a bit of the contents. And one thing you told me, uh, I found extremely interesting that could be discussed today. Also after what you just said, and after what you've just seen today. So in the term of those uh, projects highlighting uh, hidden uh, sides of technologies, engineering uh, the users. Um, the thing is, you discussed with me about this vision of um, uh, um, uh, so indigenous um, uh, music technology, right? Which is what you're talking about, right? And um, mm -hmm. and uh, these ideas, and then going further in that, and I think that's what you already has given as an ingredient of this um, uh, indigenous um African music technology uh is uh yeah. the fact of relaying on a repairing culture and on recycling and on a circular econ economy model perhaps and then I'm also wondering yeah to if we can perhaps try to discuss uh, a bit uh in this group also what uh should be also other aspects of this technology that could actually ensure a sort of safe use or avoiding manipulation of the users. Like the fact that, for example, your technology are, is so open, you know, you open the uh, the CD record, the, the CD player, and you can see all the components. And this is already something that yeah. actually, uh, compared to that black box we have seen this morning with the uh, Amazon uh, Alexa, which is something well, I understand I'm totally black box. This is a completely other aspect. And so, uh, yeah, I'd like to try at least to uh, uh, discuss this um, way of making technologies that could be uh, for music, uh, Africa-centered, and, you know, this big difference of like Western technology and non-Western technology, East African technology, all this kind of thing. Should we start a little discussion about it? Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> my 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 area of expertise is really is music. I'll I'll show you. This is this is a controller I use. Uh, it's called a beat step. 
and if you see the pads, um, if you count the pads that are in a line, the eight pads, it, it's used for playing rhythms, really. Uh, uh, it's called a beat step pro. So it has eight parts. It's laid out really in a what's the most um, a common beat, which would say the four over four, you know. But um, this represents of what rhythm is, and most especially to like Americans and <laughs> and Europeans, because that's how they perceive rhythm, you know. If I wanted to play an African rhythm, which, which is not like a four over four, something like a 12 eight. I I don't get like very <laughs> the details of that, but like if I wanted to play traditional African music rhythm on this, I cannot do that because the person that was making this controller was making it for people within his you know perhaps vicinity you know perhaps it was designed with that the consumer of this is going to be a European you know but then when I get it and I want to play African music on it, I cannot because. It was not developed by an African, you know? So I don't blame the people that develop such, such technology, but it's because, it, like, it's unavoidable. It's it's like how they, you, you, sometimes you hear that they developed an algorithm and it cannot, you know, this, like, without intending it, somehow it cannot detect, like, the faces of Black people or whatever, you know, all of this stuff. Sometimes it's not because it was intentional from the people that developed the technology, but they did not think of a case where it would be used somewhere in, you know, Uganda, but eventually it ends there. You know what I mean? I'm not saying there's no discrimination in technology and stuff like that, but if you're not developing your own technology, if it's not an African that's making a controller like this, those are things that are not going to be intuitive. Like they're not going to be thought about as the technology is going to be being developed. So that definitely there's need. And for a person like me who has at least got some, you know, who has developed the skills and I've got a bit of attention and got to meet people that can make things happen, it's it's the right thing to do, you know, to make uh, like the first company that makes instruments out of Africa, you know, that like I showed you, we've had all this, you know, drums and stuff and it has stayed the same for the last 1,000 years. There's no more innovation. The innovation that was done on, you know, on some of this stuff is it's, it's one thousand years old. You know, just getting a skin and wrapping it around, you know, a piece of wood, and then you make a a drum. You know, that's how it has been for the last one thousand years. But there's need for innovation to move it forward to make make it relevant. How if I wanted to connect this to a computer, how would I do that? If I want to make music with it and make beats with this, I cannot. I'd have to use technology instruments that are made by European people, but that are made by Americans, Canadians, you know. But if Africans do that and integrate technology in what we also have, then you know, then we become part of the conversation. We use what you know, what 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 we have. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's very fascinating. Oh, Agnese, <laughs> Agnese, please, you want to say something? Yes. Hello, Brian. Thank you very much for this beautiful uh, presentation of your work. I have a question. I'm wondering um, which is the reaction of the public, I mean, of the people that you meet uh, when you play for people, and if uh, kids uh, are curious about your work and if you run a workshop or uh, try to... Uh, spread your attitude towards the creation of your own instruments. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've, 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 I've started when, when I get the opportunity. I actually do workshops, you know, to kind of inspire people. Because, uh, however much I'm talking about um, music in this specific, particular case. This information is not relevant only for music. These are skills that can be useful in uh, broad aspects, you know? For example, if you learn how to program a computer, if you if you learn how to program to make a software that works with music, you've learned how to program, you've got a skill. You can use that skill probably to also learn how to make a website for your own courses. You can use... It's a crossover, you know. I don't look at it as 
this is specific you know to music so when i get a chance you know i speak to people even you know i'm and i'm getting more and more opportunities even when i'm invited abroad to not only do performances because i perform with the instruments i build all this stuff the tools that i use in my performances but also to 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 give my thoughts to show like as an african you know given the context that africa is not known for you know developing technology which is which is the truth you know it's a sad truth we, we are not part of the conversation in terms of like influencing technology i mean you guys are talking about ai i've not had any you know african african generated stuff you know all that you say that conversation about what google is doing what microsoft is doing and there's, there's no african company in that conversation so it means at the end of the day we're not going to benefit out of that technology you cannot only be consumers of the technology you cannot benefit as people that are making the technology so when i get a chance i have these conversations and you know sometimes i talk because that's who i am i mean i talk these things i like to talk about them but then once in a while someone says man you know the things that you're talking about the conversations we really really need to have as, as africans Thank you. So, mentioned, so the topic is very wide and, and big. And uh, I mean, the interesting part is that there's a space for imagining uh, new actions. And uh, so, um, I don't know exactly how to conclude. I think that we, should uh, somehow conclude now. And uh, thank you, everybody. So, uh, Yara, please. Can I ask everyone to turn on your, your video for one second so I can just take a screenshot. And also, if Brian, you have a way to contact you. Um, I think also that like a lot of the, I mean, many people here with us who are in, currently in Uganda and South Sudan. Um, maybe you can co like collaborate, like they, a lot of them work in similar kind of ways of DIY and in these kind of, uh, in like Pagarinia uh, settlement or in Rhino camp and so on that are working with repair and working with hardware and so on. That I really think that you should somehow further the conversation if that is what you want. So if you can share like some way to contact you and then if everyone can turn on their camera for just one second so we can do a screenshot, that would be amazing. Chexana, Brut, Romeo, etc. So uh, sorry. During the middle. Um, sorry, but your sound is. Uh... I'm saying, can I speak now? Because it's oh, like yes, you. Yes, for sure. To to okay, yeah. Uh, you can contact me through. I, I'm very active on Instagram these days. You can just send me a message. Tell me, you know, interestingly, like, I, the people who follow my work, if I check like on YouTube. It's Americans and Europeans still, you know, like I got my breakthrough out, not even in Uganda. I got my breakthrough outside Uganda. It's I started getting attention, you know, like right now in the last, the last two months, you know, uh, Ethiopia Airways did a story about me and they made me the cover of their magazine, the in-flight magazine, you know, like for the last, like the last two months. But all these things, like people who got to know me, uh, people who are not Ugandan. It's eventually that all this attention, you know, when someone would hear that you've been featured on the cover of Ethiopia, Air, they'll be like, man, but what are you doing? You know, but this is your friend whom you've been telling these things each and every day. <laughs> someone you walk with every day. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's how things work, but yeah, to me, that's, that's what I believe is we have the solutions. They don't need to be theoretical. You don't need to be there and say, 
I need to have the same resources as an American, as a European, to do something in Africa. Or I have to first have their technology. Like, look around. The resources everywhere. Even those people you look at and say they're doing something, they're using the knowledge and within the, you know, what's relevant within the community. That cannot be relevant to you, where you come from because the challenges are different. You know? So we have to look from within and around us before we look overseas and, you know, so many fire places. Uh, well said. Uh, um, can I ask you to share your Instagram because there's actually uh, yeah. an anonymous, uh, yeah, yeah. and then it's uh, in Chicago, and so uh, it's it's a different things, so somehow different. Yeah. And uh, if you can share in the chat your Instagram because uh, yeah, I'm not fully sure which one is. Uh, so if you can check it for a moment and share it, that would be. Amazing. Uh, let me send it in, in the, the chat right now. Um, do, you, do you see the chat? Yeah. Okay, that's the Instagram. David. Um, I wanted to give uh, the mic to Agnese for uh, instructing us for uh, the next uh, webinar next week. Please, Agnese. Thank you, Brian. Uh, yes, very briefly, we are meeting again next uh, week on uh, uh, Tuesday, the 19th, and uh, we will uh, dig deeper on some of the, of the topic issues uh, raised today, especially the question of uh, our relationship with the digital technologies and how certain platform uh, they um, give us uh, certain behaviors and how can we deal with that, uh, how does it work and uh, which other tools we can use. And uh, we may have a special guest, uh, Stella Nianzi, that you maybe already met in uh, some uh, uh, earlier webinar. Uh, it's almost confirmed uh, she may come to greet us and tell us something about the digital uh, actions uh, she has been running in Uganda, as you may know, uh, on uh, social media. So uh, you're welcome. And uh, I sent in the chat some links to uh, dig deeper into some of the topics raised today and uh, that we can even discuss further next time. So thank you to Brian very, very much for your very interesting presentation and to Sabina and to the whole AskNet and RogNet community. Uh, cool, cool. So just last thing, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share the, 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 the presentation with the, I show you today. There's all links so you can really dig into each of the projects and find uh, perhaps way more uh, stuff by starting this research. And uh, yeah, from me, this is all. And I'm very enthusiastic of having been uh, given this opportunity to share with you and this exchange, it was uh, very uh, meaningful for me. I hope that uh, it was for you uh, a bit as well. And yeah, for me, it's from Berlin, this is all. <laughs>